focus today is the mission that's at hand. Onward, our mission continues. Well, as you probably noticed, our pastor is not standing here. He's taking a few days away uh, just to get some rest and relaxation. Uh, you're stuck with me. continues and give you four keys to maintaining spiritual momentum. After all, it's football season. A whole bunch of schools played yesterday. The Chiefs play this Thursday. What better way to kick off thinking about momentum in sports than talking about spiritual momentum? So let's have some fun today, amen? All right. Let me talk about the word onward for just a second. It's all about pressing forward, all about continual movement, all about maintaining your momentum. The Christian life is all about action. It's all about movement and advancement, taking ground, maintaining momentum. Even when God gives us periods of rest, it's for a purpose, to gain strength, to prepare, to get physically, emotionally, spiritually healthy, ultimately to grow closer to him, but all with the mission in mind of what he would have us do. Onward is our focus. We need to take some ground. We've got to maintain spiritual momentum. Here's a few famous quotes from, from a few from the world and just some celebrities. Here's one. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you've got to keep moving forward. Martin Luther King Jr. said that. There are far, far better things ahead than any that we leave behind, C.S. Lewis said. Courage isn't having the strength to go on. It's going on when you have no strength. Napoleon Bonaparte said that. When adversity strikes, that's when you have to be the most calm. Stay strong, stay grounded, and press on. That's from the great philosopher L.L. Cool J. And then one near and dear to those that live in the Kansas City area, just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys. That was Kansas City Chiefs coach Hank Stram in Super Bowl IV a long time ago. So why, why do I give quotes from people that may or may not have integrity. If the world knows about momentum, sports, there's lots of examples of momentum. We as Christians need to have some spiritual momentum where we are moving forward for the cause of Christ. There's a few songs from some old hymns, Onward Christian Soldiers. Marching as to war with the cross of Jesus, going on before. Rouse then, soldiers, rally round the banner. Ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna. Christ is captain of the mighty throng. Anybody remember that song? Ooh, I got some amens on that one. You know, God's word has a lot to say about moving forward. He didn't call us to stand still or to sit in a pew or here a chair. We've we've got to move forward. Here's some scriptures about moving onward, all right? Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 talks about laying aside the weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us and running the race with patience, running the race with patience that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. we got to fix our hearts and our minds and our eyes on him and run 
the race that he has given us. Philippians 3, 13 and 14 talk about leaving the past behind. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Press toward the mark. Romans 8 tells us we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Isaiah 40 says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's all about moving forward. 1 Timothy 6 tells us to fight the good fight of faith. And Ecclesiastes 9 gives us the principle that whatever you're doing, do it with all of your might. Give it all you've got because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. Give it all that you've got. Get after it today. The Christian life is all about moving forward. Advancement. The Bible uses terminology like strive and fight and give and run and bear and provide and work and speak, listen, grow, Love, restore, worship, obey, hasten, rise up, call, build, do, press, go. It's all about action. We've got to have action. God has called us to do something. We have a mission. We've got to advance that mission. All while honoring the name of Jesus. That is our mission, and our mission must continue. So today, let's take a look at an Old Testament example of a man that understood the cry of onward, a man that understood what it took to fulfill the will of God, a man that knew how to maintain spiritual momentum. So let's go to Joshua chapter 10. Turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 10. Let me give you just a little bit of background of where we are. Joshua has taken over for Moses. He's now leading the children of Israel, going into the promised land. In chapter 1, God promised Joshua that he was with him. That no matter who came came up against him, that God was in control and that nothing would stop them from conquering the land that he had promised them. He told Joshua to be strong, to be courageous, to obey him, to follow the law. Chapters 2 through 5, spies are again sent into the land to Jericho. This is where they met with Rahab. They parted, the, the Lord parted the Jordan River the second time. The second time he parted, the first time he parted the Red Sea, second time the Jordan River. They walked across dry land into the promised land just like they had when they came out of Egypt. 40 years before. They amassed uh, 40,000 troops. They met at Gilgal, and then the men that had been born in the wilderness were circumcised, and there the Bible tells us God washed the reproach of them from Egypt away. Remember that place, Gilgal. More to come on that. At the end of chapter 5 and 6, Joshua talks with Jesus. He's given instructions on how to, to defeat Jericho. They do that. They walk around Jericho. Jericho is defeated. They've got this amazing spiritual momentum. Nothing can stop them. Or can it? Is there something that got in the way of their spiritual momentum? In chapter 7, we find that there is sin in the camp. Achan had taken things from Jericho, gold and silver, a precious garment, when God had said, leave it all. Don't take anything. But he had taken it. He still wanted what they had back in Egypt. He was selfish, looking at worldly things, a desire for earthly things. And they lost a battle to a tiny little city called Ai. And 36 of their men were killed. What an embarrassment. Immediately after Jericho, their momentum had come to a grinding halt. God had to deal with that sin. In chapter 8, there had to be repentance. 
There had to be a, a seeking of the Lord's face in order to start the momentum rolling again, and that's what happened. And then we get to, uh, to where we are in chapter 10. Uh, in chapter 9, there's a city called Gibeon that kind of makes a shady deal with, with Joshua and the other kings of the land. They're getting, they're getting word of this nation of Israel coming in and conquering. They hear about Gibeon making some deal with Israel. Well, they decide they're going to destroy Gibeon. We get to chapter 10, and we're going to read verses 6 through 15. Aren't you glad we still have the Word of God in our hands, that it's been preserved? It says here in verse 6, And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly, went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them to Azekah and unto Makeda. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were the going down to Beth Horon that the Lord cast great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah and they died. There were more which died with the hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Because that's just how big our God is. Verse 12, Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said, In the sight of Israel, this took faith, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. And Joshua returned and all Israel with him into the camp to Gilgal. Let's just pray once again uh, for the Lord to just bless this time. God, our Father, we just thank you. I ask that you would speak through me. Nothing that needs to be said that I want said. But just may it be what you want said. Hide me under the shadow of your cross and just may others see you and me. May others hear a message from, new, from you, not from me. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Joshua 10, talking about momentum. Momentum. We need some spiritual momentum. But what is momentum? We know a little bit about it in sports. But momentum is strength or force that's gained by motion or by a series of events. You're picking up speed. You're advancing. It requires action, the removal of obstacles. It requires perseverance. Momentum is hard to stop. It either requires a force greater than that momentum to stop it or some type of force applied over a period of time that slows it down and ultimately stops it. It'll slow down when there's obstacles in the way. It'll slow down when pers perseverance wanes or when energy is lost. If you're into science, study the laws of momentum. We don't have time for that today. Spiritual momentum is the same. You know, Israel had followed God. They had seen miracles from God. They were powering through their mission. They were, they were finally into the promised land. And then they ran into a force that stopped their momentum, and it was sin. They turned back from the ways of God to the things of Egypt, and their momentum stopped. And then, like I said before, it took repentance and the eyes on the Lord for them to get that momentum back again. It's the same for us. In order to continue our mission, we must maintain spiritual momentum at all costs. When it slows or stops, we've got to turn back to the Lord to get moving once again. The hardest part about momentum is the starting point. We just got to get started and then let the Lord do what the Lord does. We've just got to get rolling. So today, let's get into four keys to maintaining spiritual momentum from this passage. The first one, you got to have a relationship with God to have any spiritual momentum. You've got to. 
Look at verses 8 and 12, just the first parts of these verses. Verse 8 says, and the Lord said unto Joshua. And verse 12 says, then spake Joshua to the Lord. The Lord spake to Joshua. Joshua spoke to the Lord. There was a relationship there. He talked to God. God talked to him. They had a deep relationship. God knew Joshua. Joshua knew God. You've got to have a relationship with God in order to have any spiritual momentum. Before you can ever talk about movement forward, you've got to be plugged into the source of all momentum, and that's Jesus Christ. A personal relationship with him is your starting point. Being a member of this church, getting baptized, going to seminary, doing great works for the Lord, those are all great things. But that's not what saves you. Salvation and forgiveness is through Christ alone. John 3, 16, you all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It was his perfect spotless blood that paid the price for sins. Not a church, not water, not good works, not a seminary. It was his blood that paid the price he is the perfect son of god and a relationship with him is all about believing his gospel he came to this earth he lived a sinless life he sacrificed that life for us on the cross paid the price for our sins dead buried but it didn't stop there he rose again victorious he rose again from the dead. That's the good news of Jesus. And having a relationship with him is not complicated. Religion likes to make it complicated. It's as simple as turning from your own way, realizing that you are dead in your sins, repenting, going to the Lord and saying, I need you. I need you. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to run my life. I, I'm, I'm nothing without you. Please save me. Lord, save me me. Romans 10 tells us if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So I beg of you today, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, give your life to him today. Give your life to him today. His gift of salvation is free. It's free. It's a starting point for spiritual momentum. It's free for all those that call on him as Lord. You'll have a chance to meet with him. Pray with someone at the end of the service. I beg of you, if you've never put your faith and trust in him, that you do so today. But how about for us Christians? Just like with Joshua, the first key to our spiritual momentum is our relationship with God. It was the first thing that we needed to have for salvation, but it's still the first thing that we need to have any spiritual momentum. So I ask you, how deep is your relationship with God? How much time do you spend with him? How well do you know him? How well do you know his word? And how you answer those questions will go a long way to how much spiritual momentum you'll have. You've got to know him. You've got to walk with him. You've got to allow him to lead you and to guide you and to grow closer to him. That gives you the spiritual momentum. Look at some scriptural examples. Peter, he had some spiritual momentum and lost some of it, right? Here in this passage of Matthew, he's, he's walking on water. Anybody here ever walked on water? No. He's walking on water. I mean, I would consider that that's some pretty good spiritual momentum. If you can walk on water, and then he takes a look around and sees the circumstances, the storms, the waves, and the wind, and he began to sink because his eyes weren't on the Lord anymore. But what did he do? He said, Lord, save me, which is what we all need to do when we get our eyes off Jesus and instead on the storms. We've got to cry out to him again because he is our Lord. David was an amazing king, but he became complacent. 
comfortable. His momentum was killed because he was just sitting around, not at the place that he was supposed to be. And he ended up having a different kind of momentum that snowballed out of control from complacency to lust to adultery to murder to just being deceitful. He had lost all that momentum, and then it took a repentant heart, Psalm 51, a repentant heart for God to start his momentum again. How about these other ones? Daniel, he maintained spiritual momentum in the face of adversity. He was in a pagan land, a slave could have stopped all of his momentum, and yet he continued to trust the Lord. He continued to have a personal relationship with God Almighty. He prayed three times a day, even though it was against the law. And we know that God continued to bless him, rescued him from the den of lions. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 11, read that, uh, he, he, he maintained his spiritual momentum, although he was shipwrecked, Although he was beaten, although he was stoned, he went through times of weariness and hunger, more discomfort than most of us can ever imagine, but he kept his eyes on the Lord. He walked with God through it all, kept that spiritual momentum. God gave him strength even when he was weak and continued to use him in amazing ways because he just stayed faithful to the Lord. We've got to be that way. Our relationship with the Lord needs to be so personal, so strong, so deep, so intimate. Momentum killers. Sometimes things get in the way. Momentum killers for a relationship with God, really it's anything that will take your eyes off of him will slow or stop your momentum. Could be health, could be sin, could be financial uh, hardships, could be a job loss, could be a trouble with children, could be ministry failures or church issues or just relationship issues. All of these have the potential to slow or stop your momentum, but they also have the potential to draw you closer to the Lord. The choice is yours. The choice is yours. We've got to want to be close to Lord, to the Lord. We can't wallow in, in, in the, the despair that this life brings because we know that this earth is not our home. And one day we'll be with him forever. Have you allowed life to sap some of the momentum out of your life? Have you allowed circumstances maybe that were out of your control to keep you from a deeper walk with Jesus? Brothers and sisters, I challenge you, you got to get your momentum from where it first started, and that's a relationship with Jesus. Spend time in prayer, and then spend more time in prayer, and spend time in his word, and then spend more time in his word. Worship him in spirit and in truth. Serve him. Serve others. Be mission-minded. Reach the lost. Start doing something for the king. It's going to take effort. It's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take commitment. It's going to take discipline and determination and faith in him. We've got to do it. Our mission is before us. It's why we are here on the earth. Get that spiritual momentum moving with the strength of the Lord and never look back. Keep your eyes on him. Maintain that momentum. For our second key, back to our scripture in Joshua Give the Lord everything. Once you have a relationship with the Lord, just give him everything you got. Give him everything you've got. Look at verse 9 in Joshua chapter 10. It says here, in verse 8 it says, The Lord said to Joshua, Fear them not, I've delivered them into your hand. No one's going to stand before you. And then in verse 9 it says, Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. He gave the Lord everything that he had. He moved suddenly and then traveled all night to get to the battle. Now, any of you in here, in here that's been in the military, would they tell you before the battle, let's just travel all night and then fight? How about that one? Don't worry about rest. Let's just go. That's probably not a good strategy. But the Lord works in different ways than what we think, right? He traveled all night to get to the battle. He gave his all. 
as Christians, we too are challenged to give all that we have. Romans 12 tells that we should be a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Lives that will just lay down anything for the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark 12 tells us to love the Lord with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our mind and with all of our strength. Everything that you've got and before your love for anyone or anything else, it's his, his alone. Matthew 6 tells us to seek first the kingdom of God. 1 John 3 tells us to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. 2 Corinthians 9 talks about sowing and reaping and how we should sow seed bountifully if we want to reap a bountiful harvest. That we need to cheerfully give and then trust God to provide. Spiritual momentum requires maximum effort. Maximum effort. The sacrifice of your time and your talent and your treasures. There are also momentum killers to this. Do you ever just want to keep control? Any, any control freaks in here? You just got to have some control, right? There's parts of our lives that we just want to control because we're so talented or, or so knowledgeable and, and, and we've just got this part. We, we don't need any help with this. God wants us to give him everything. God wants us to surrender everything, even those areas that you don't really want to let go. Maybe sometimes you just want to hold back when, when God wants you to fully dive in. Fear, anxiety, just worry sometimes. Ah, I, I know he's told us to, to do this. I'm, I'm just not sure. I, I, I don't want to be rejected and... Dive in. Surrender all. Trust him to give you the strength and the words to say and what to do in every situation. When God says go or do, get after it, as Brownie would say. If he's commanded you to do something, he's going to equip you and supply to make sure that it gets done in his strength and in his power so that he gets the glory. It's about us moving forward. Hey, are you with me, though? Are you with me this morning, church? You shout or, or say a bit or something, just nod at me or do a little kick or something, all right? Here's some scriptural examples of people giving the Lord everything. The woman with the alabaster box, she poured out the most precious possession that she had for Jesus. Expensive and precious ointment reserved for her wedding day, poured out on Jesus, washing his feet with her hair. What an example of true worship and sacrifice. The giving widow in the middle of all of the people giving percentages of their income, percentages of what they had, percentages of their alms, we find this widow, and Jesus told his disciples, take notice. She threw in two little coins, but she gave more than anybody else today because she gave everything that she had. When Jesus points someone out, that's a big deal. He said, on the surface, it looks like all of these wealthy people, and they're, they're giving out of their abundance, and that's great. Here's someone that gave everything that she had, not knowing what tomorrow would bring. And Jesus pointed that out, said, that's how, that's how you need to be. Give everything, lay everything down for the king. It took faith for her to do that. Paul and Silas, they were imprisoned and shackled, put in the worst conditions for preaching Jesus. And yet we find them praying and singing so loud in the middle of the night that other prisoners could hear them. Even in the worst circumstances, it may have seemed that their momentum had stopped, but the Lord was in control, and they just focused their eyes on him, and they continued to worship him, and they continued to commune with him, and they just trusted that whatever the outcome was that, that, that would happen, it was all up to him. And we know that he rescued them from that situation. Epaphroditus spent some time really, really looking at this this week. Scripture tells us that this man had ministered so much, had given so much that he was near death. He gave everything to the Lord. And then in our passage, Joshua, he immediately obeyed God. He went all night long to accomplish the mission that he had been given. So I ask you, what mission has God given you? And how hard are you really going after it? Are you given everything that you've got? Don't allow those momentum killers like fear and worry and doubt and anxiety or lack of control 
keep you from fulfilling that mission he's called you to fulfill. It requires spiritual momentum. As our youth pastor Josh Bennett would say, let's go. He always says that, always telling the kids, let's go, let's go. Give the Lord everything. Give the Lord everything. All right, the third one, moving right along. I don't know that I'll get you out early, but we're moving fast. The third one, we have a relationship with the Lord. We've given him everything that we've got. We need to have a place of refuge and worship. We need to have a place of refuge and worship. In verse 6, it, sa- it says in verse 6, The men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal. And then in verse 15 it says, Joshua returned and all Israel with him unto the camp to Gilgal. What is the significance of Gilgal? Remember, as I said at the introduction, that it was at Gilgal that God had washed away the stench of Egypt off of them. It was there that the men in the wilderness who had been born over that 40 years were circumcised as an all-in proclamation to God. Joshua returned there. Joshua started there. Joshua went back there. It was a place of refuge. It was a place of worship. It was a place in God where t- spent time in God's presence to prepare for what was ahead. He was ready whenever they came to him. He went back there again to prepare for whatever was next. Gilgal literally means rolled away. Aren't you glad that God rolled away your disgrace? Aren't you glad that God rolled away your sin? Rolled away your past defeats? I'm glad he rolled away the stone. And Jesus rose from the dead, right? Gilgal was this place for starting over. The place of a new creation, of a clean heart. A place where we move forward in complete dependence on the Lord. That's what it was for the nation of Israel and for Joshua. These scriptures, 1 Chronicles, listen to this. Actually, let's just turn there. Make sure you guys still have a Bible you can turn into or an electronic device. First Chronicles 16, verses 8 through 11. I'll give you just a second to turn there. Don't you love to hear the rustle of the pages? It's a special day for me to be here. I'm so thankful for the privilege to do this. So thankful it's the first time I've ever spoken with my grandson in the auditorium. Pretty exciting. First Chronicles 16, 8 through 11 says, Give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. You've got to have a place of worship and refuge. You've got to get along with the Lord and say thank you. Then you've got to tell somebody what he's taught you and what he's done for you. And then you've got to go to him some more and sing to him and praise him and talk, talk to him about all the wonderful things that he's done. And then you got to glory in his name and tell him how great he is. And that he's the, Jesus is the name above all names. Rejoice and seek the Lord. Seek him. Seek his strength. Seek his face continually. We've got to have these times where we get alone with the Lord. And just allow him to purge us and cleanse us and instruct us and guide us and strengthen us. We've got to have these times. Psalm 63 says, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Hebrews 4 tells us that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. We obtain mercy. Find help in our times of need. And Romans 8 says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. 
We have this amazing Father that is so good to us. He's adopted us into his family. He calls us his children. And he longs for us to come to him. And we can cry out to him on our best days or on our worst days. And we can say, oh, Father, Daddy, Daddy, I just want to be with you today. I just want to be in your presence. And, I, and it's been rough, and I just need you to hold me for a little while. Or you can say, it's been so good. It's been so good, and I'm so thankful. Keep using me. Keep pouring out your, your faith and your love and your light through me. We need a spiritual Gilgal. We need a spiritual Gilgal. Here's some, here's some scriptural examples. Daniel, like I said earlier, he prayed to God three times a day in his upper chamber facing Jerusalem. Abraham, Bobby, I've heard Bobby preach Genesis 22. I just love hearing him preach about worship and love. Abraham, he built an altar to God. The scripture tells us five different times. Five different times with that fifth one being Genesis 22. He was a man of worship. He, he wanted to be in the presence of God, a place of refuge where he could worship him and gain strength and, and just make sure that he was doing exactly what God had called him to do. Scripture records six instances when Jesus got alone with his father to pray. This is how he could, as Brian Calloway preached, could go a little further. This is how he, when it was time to go to Jerusalem, the Bible tells us that he set his face. Nothing was going to stop him from the mission that he was there to do. He set his face to Jerusalem and went all the way there, all the way to the cross through that, that joke of a trial. But he did it willingly. There was nothing that was going to stop him. He wasn't, he wasn't taken against his own will he voluntarily went to Jerusalem, voluntarily went to the cross because he knew that we needed a savior, that we needed forgiveness, that we needed the price for our sins to be paid. I'm so thankful. But he was able to do that because he got along with his father in the desert and in the mountains and in the garden of Gethsemane. He, he spent time with his father. That's also how he was able to pray in the garden, not my will but thine be done. Even from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. His mind and his heart were fixed on what was ahead. We need to be mission-minded. We need a spiritual Gilgal. But there's also momentum killers to this. Sometimes we just feel so guilty. And we don't want to spend time with God because we don't think we deserve him. We feel the shame of our decisions. The past just gets us sometimes. Maybe we run back to bad habits. Maybe today's, today's culture just is so enticing and we run to that. Those are things that get in the way of our times of worship and refuge. Our enemy wants us to be distracted. He wants us to slow that spiritual momentum or even stop it. He wants us to live in shame and feel underqualified and that we don't have any value you need these times of refuge and worship in the presence of the Lord to remind you that you are valuable, to remind you how much the Lord loves you, to, to have him give you the strength that you need. We need those sweet hours of prayer. Look at these lyrics. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care. And bids me at my Father's throne, make all my wants and wishes known. Sing it with me. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief. And oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. We need spiritual Gilgals. We need time with the Lord. Maybe for you it's a prayer closet that you have. For Jesus, like I said, it was a mountain or a desert. 
Maybe it's a coffee shop where you can just sit there and spend time with the Lord. It might be your kitchen table or your patio or your deck. Or maybe when you're riding to school or work in the car or bus, you just spend time talking to the Lord. Maybe it's when you work out, take a long walk or run or lift weights. Maybe you do journaling and you just talk about all that God has done or like Patty Williams, just talk to the Lord and tell him all of the things that he's doing and how special he is to her. You know, we need those times of refuge and worship at our Gilgals. It's there that we're reminded that our salvation is so sweet and that we have eternal security with the Lord. It's there that he reminds us, I washed off all of that Egypt from you whenever I paid the price for your sins. I washed all that past away and I made you new. I'm so glad he reminds me of that. I'm so glad he reminds me of that. He says, I cleansed you with my blood. I paid the price for you. It's at those times that we recharge and we prepare and we gain strength and we get healthy and then we either continue to maintain our momentum or we start it once again. So I challenge you, if you've lost some momentum or maybe if you're just sitting still, you got to get alone with the Lord. Starts with him. It starts with just reminding yourself of the salvation that you have in him, allowing him to speak truth into you, to speak life into you, to give you the strength that you need so that you can have momentum. Are you with me, church? Onward, the mission continues. The last key today once you've got a relationship with God, once you've given him all you've got, once you've spent this sweet time with him, continually being recharged. How about ask him for some extraordinary things? Ask God for the extraordinary. Look at verses 12 through 14, back in Joshua chapter 10. It says here, Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, this took faith, Son, stand still. Stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still. And the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. It's not this written in the book of Jasher. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven. They hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened to the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for Israel. Big prayer to ask God to stop the sun and the moon. Extraordinary. No one had ever done that before. Hadn't happened since. Why can't it be the same for us? Why can't we pray big things? Why, not, why don't I pray big things? Maybe I just don't ask the Lord. Maybe we just don't ask the Lord to do the impossible because we lack the faith that he really will do it. Joshua prayed and the sun stood still. Until the battle was over. James 5 tells us the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Philippians 4 talks about having the peace of God ruling in our hearts. But we've got to ask him for it. His peace will pass all understanding. He says be careful for nothing. Don't be so anxious. Don't, don't worry so much. Give it all to him. Take your request to God with a thankful heart. Jeremiah 32, 27 says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything too hard for me? We got a warning in James chapter 4. He tells us that our prayers are often not answered because we ask them amiss. We ask them because of our own selfishness, our own lust. We want God to just give to us rather than God to give through us. Momentum killers for this, a lack of faith, a lack of understanding. Maybe it's a belief, like I said earlier, that you just hold no value. God's not done with you. God loves you. You are his child. Don't believe the lies of our enemy. God longs to bless you. He longs to pour out his goodness on you. Every good and perfect thing is from him. 
cometh from the Father of lights, whom there is no shadow of turning. Great is his faithfulness, right? If you feel like you've got a lack of faith or a lack of understanding, you're in the right place. Hearing the word is what strengthens your faith. If you've never been taught, talk to one of us. We'll make sure that you can get with someone or another couple and spend time learning God's word. We just use a big word called discipleship. And you can have hearts that are knit together, fellowshipping around the word together as your faith is strengthened and you grow closer to one another. All right, how about some scriptural examples for this? Extraordinary examples, people that were asking extraordinary things. As, as in our text, Joshua prayed and had the sun stand still. In Acts chapter 3, Peter's prayer, God healed a lame man that had been lame since birth. In James chapter 5, it gives the account of how Elijah prayed and God caused it not to rain for three and a half years. Not three and a half days, not three and a half months, three and a half years. But God was pretty amazing in all of that because just to prove how God really is and who he really is, as soon as, as, soon as Elijah prayed that it would rain, boom, God caused rain after three and a half years. It was this extraordinary prayer from his prophet. In Exodus chapter 32, the prayer of Moses saved Israel. God was getting ready to destroy them and start everything over with Moses. And Moses begged and pleaded for God intervene for them and then how about this extraordinary prayer the thief on the cross yeah. he deserved to be there he was a criminal didn't get baptized probably didn't go to church definitely didn't go to seminary had never been through discipleship he deserved what he was getting he didn't deserve any kind of mercy or any kind of forgiveness, but neither did we. And his extraordinary prayer was to cry out to the Son of God beside him. Please help me. Please help me. Take me with you. I believe who you are. Take me with you. What an extraordinary prayer from someone that didn't deserve any of that. But that's what, that's what we did with the Lord as well. We cried out to him, and in all his mercy, he saved us. In spite of us, in spite of any past that we've had, he saved us. He saved our souls and gave us new life. What an extraordinary prayer from the cross to the Son of God next to him. If you're going to make your prayers, make them big. Make them big. But make sure they're mission-minded so that the Lord gets all the glory. Pray big not to win the lottery, but to win souls. Pray, pray not to have a bigger house, but to be more hospitable with the one that you've got. And to welcome people in and share the love of Jesus with them. Pray not to just have more friends, but to allow the Lord to have you make new friends. Because there's people all around that need the love of Jesus in you. Pray not for fame, but for the name of Jesus to be known. He should be the famous one. Point all the glory to him. Pray for God not to just bless you, but like I said before, for God to bless through you. Not keeping any of it for yourself. Do you pray for the extraordinary? Do you pray for God to use you to win souls? Do you pray for God to bless others through you? Do you pray for more strength to witness? Do you pray for him to bless you with more money that you can give to missions or to support uh, someone needy or to give a scholarship to a team for camp? Do you pray for God to do that? Maybe your prayer should be, God, if you give me a bonus, I will give it all to you. But I'm going to give you what I've got to start with. Got to start somewhere. Then pray some extraordinary prayers for the Lord. Pray for more joy so that you can be more of an encouragement to others and point them to Jesus. These are extraordinary prayers. All right, to wrap things up, four keys to spiritual momentum. Our mission continues. God would have us move forward. Onward, Christian soldiers. It starts with God and with you. 
It starts your with your relationship with him. And then momentum starts picking up when you give him everything, when you give him maximum effort. When you just lay down your life for him, that momentum starts to build and starts to build and starts to move quicker and more is done for his kingdom. And you just look around and just are amazed at all that God is doing through you. And then you have those periods of time where you just get into his presence and you're, you're strengthened and you're, 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 you're just washed over with his goodness. When you meet with him, you got to do that on a consistent basis to keep that momentum rolling. You've got to have that if you want to have the mission that he's given you accomplished. And then once that momentum is in full swing, how about start asking God for the extraordinary to happen as long as it's according to his will? Because he, I, don't, I don't need anything as far as this world has to give. I just want God to use me. And, and all along the way, he's providing to make sure that happens when we have his will in mind. And so church, I just challenge you, we're getting ready to have that conference in a month, advance the mission. Let's move forward. Let's claim some more ground. We, we don't know our days are, are numbered and the time is short before Jesus returns. Let's gain some more ground. Let's reach some more people. Let's advance the mission. He is worthy. He is worth it. Amen. Well, at the end here, I, I ask you just to, how about stand to your feet? We'll have a little time to reflect, a time to pray and just uh, bow your heads and close your eyes, and I'm going to pray, and, and, and after the prayer, we're going to have some music, and it's time for you to make some decisions. Maybe the Lord touched on something that you just need to, to give over to Him, or something that you just need to change in your life. Maybe you just need to spend more time with Him and rededicate all that He's done for you and all that He's given you and serve Him once again. Whatever that is, we're going to have some time give you to pray. You can come down here. If you want to meet with the Lord, you can come down here. If you just want to pray, come down here, sit there at your seat, whichever you want to do. So let me pray. Father, I